The following podcast is a deep, shallow dive production. And you're going to love it. Okay, let's go. You know, I mean, we both we both have the glasses on, but you're going to have to send me one of those hats. I'm, I'm going to need a need to wear one of those hats next time. All right. Listen, everybody. Hey, another another great episode today that I've been really excited to to bring this guy on. And obviously, with everything that took place this weekend with President Trump, we kind of moved this up on the calendar in order to do it sooner versus later. But, you know, get Get used to this face because this is David Nordell, and he is a retired United States Air Force Command Chief Master Sergeant with over 30 years of service. He's all the, he's also the CEO of MaxFab Consulting, where he focuses on veteran transition and leadership development, which, by the way, I think is incredibly cool. And he is going to shed light on, man, a lot, a lot of different things and a lot of things that we've talked on the podcast before military industrial complex, the Uniparty, sure. all this stuff. But David, hey man, I appreciate you making making the time. Thanks for joining. Yeah, what's going on, brother? I mean, not much. Really? I mean, you and I had a really deep conversation that kind of ended up like ruining a whole half a day, and I don't think we, I don't think we ever got to the to the finish line. And we knew we were going to do this, you know, for everybody else's, you know ability to digest it but now you know i think where we're going today right is we're going to just have some candid conversations and you know there's like i know that the majority of the people that probably listen to this and might be a little bit of group think i hope there's some people out there that, that tune in to get some some alternative uh alternative viewpoints but um you know boy when you and i were talking we were talking not just about passion and then love of our country but we were talking from a level of expertise and i'm just ready to do that uh you know i don't Good. like the i don't I, I don't I don't, I don't like to talk about quilting because you know what? I don't know anything about it. There you go. There you go. But I'll tell you what you knew, what you do know about is the military and you've also got experience in terms of secret service. So let's start sure. there, man. Oh, yeah. Let's yeah, start you got, there. You got President Trump assassination so, attempt. What's so, your take, man? Dude, scary moment for me. You know, I'm, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm the proud owner of PTSD and moral injury, and we'll probably hedge a little bit on on how I got there and, and what that's about. And the hat has a little bit to to, to go with that, but so um, let me tell you, I was watching live. I was down in Arizona, um, and I'm watching live, and I probably didn't have the normal reaction that most people do because I know I knew what was happening from the very first noise that came through television. And I and and I think the one you're going to find out is the first round missed him, the second round hit him in the air. And if you see him turn his head, he was lucky. So, uh, I think I told you earlier. You know, I was I was attached to the Secret Service in Tokyo for three days. I was stationed there. They, they I was attached as the medical response team for President Bush, the second Bush, Bush two, and um, uh. And they integrate you into the team. I mean, you're in the convo. I mean, you're doing their work. You know what the first thing they did, Ray, was? What? They dropped off. They gave me a call sign. They gave us, I should say. They gave us a call sign, and they established comms. So let me give you, for instance, the ambulance is usually the last, if not the second to the last vehicle in the convoy. And there's a reason. If I'm driving down the road and I see some guy with a rifle, and I'm the guy that sees him, I click the button, I tell them who I am, let's say the call sign's medic, and I say, medic, there's an unidentified individual, looks like he has a firearm at 3 o'clock, blah, blah, blah. Everybody hears that, right? It goes into everybody's earpieces, right. right? On that trip, during that three days, we had somebody that actually got through some exterior security and ran down the hillside towards the convoy that the president was in. And the Secret Service lost their minds, you know, and they were really hard on themselves, self-evaluation and those kind of things. To me, it seemed innocuous because the guy was never in a position where he could ever hurt the president, especially when they're in those cars, that kind of stuff. And he really didn't have a lot of capability. He was just a goofy guy getting into his face and then well, Somebody asked me today what I thought about the fact that a guy had that close to take a shot at a former president or a president or anybody that's under protection based on who they are. Here's what I liken it to. I liken it to somebody that's played in the NFL for 25 years. They got a 25-year career. Tom Brady. Let's say Tom Brady. 
And the game starts, and Tom Brady runs out on the field, and he doesn't have a helmet. And during the first play of the game, somebody hits Tom Brady, and there's blood everywhere. His nose is bleeding and everything because he doesn't have a helmet on. And somebody goes, one, why didn't Tom Brady know he needed a helmet after 25 years? And two, who let him go out on the field and run a play with no helmet on? That's how egregious this is in my, in my viewpoint. That close. Uh, that building had elevation to it. Yeah, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a window in a, in a, in a book depository a book building. Depository, and, and, exactly. And Dealey Plaza. But, you know, if you go back and you dissect the whole Dealey Plaza thing, there was a lot of people there doing a lot of work. And everybody was, you know, a, I shouldn't say a dang. Everybody was two seconds late and two seconds short. So the whole thing to me is absolutely weird. Um, and, you know, on a larger scale, we're, we're operating in such divide right now and such mistrust. I mean, we're going to put together committees um, to study this. I just don't know how deep they're going to dig. Yeah. You know, yeah. It, it, it's so easy anymore to say, well, I had a bad day. In fact, we've heard that already, right? My, I just had a bad day or a bad night or whatever it was. Uh, in some professions, you know, I grew up in medicine. I'm a shock trauma nurse. You know, when the, when the lady, when the lady at the bank goes, Oh, I, I'm sorry, you know, the, the computer's down and we've had a bad day, so I can't get you your money. I say, you know, I'm not allowed to get that. You use that excuse. If my computer's down and you're having a heart attack, I gotta figure it out. The Secret Service is better than that. Everybody that I've ever dealt with in the Secret Service and even here locally, when we've had the president come during campaign times, they are meticulous. They, they, Ridiculous. they are. They, they, they ha I mean, you would think they have to be And the things that the things that really jumped out at me when I saw that happening on Saturday was, you know, first of all, the, the layout, when you see the aerial there, there's not like 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 you said, this isn't a book depository, 20 different angles, 20 different rooms. There's literally that's the only building that was near the stage. So. How on earth? And by the way, the guy, you know, I don't even want to mention his name to give a, I don't even Matthew something, but like, right. it's not like this guy also seemed like a, a disgruntled military veteran who had crazy skills and knew exactly what he was doing. You know, he looked like he was dressed to go to a Jimmy Buffett concert or something like that. So how does he with the ladder and with everything get up onto a building that seemed in unbelievably plain sight? And then you see all these videos. TMZ had a, had a video, you know, people are citizens are alerting the various law enforcement, hey, there's a guy up there with a gun. The question becomes, and, and I had this conversation with, with somebody else who told me there were either four or five different groups of law enforcement in charge of the president's security. You've got Secret right. Service. Right. You've got the local law enforcement. I think the sheriff's department. Sure. And then Highway I, Patrol. I'm sure, and Highway, yeah, Highway Patrol. Highway Patrol. And then, Patrol. Yeah. And then Trump's own personal, he's got to have his own right. personal. It's he like does, yes. the question becomes, how did that even happen? And then from there, it really is who, who who's responsible, who dropped the ball, right. you know? Well, let me, let me give you some boring statistics when it plays to this. Because, you know, my, my graduate works all in disaster management. And if you put a bunch of emergency managers in a room, you know, these are the guys that tell you which way to drive on hurricanes. That's the other side of my work. If you put us all in a room and said, what one problem do we need to solve to make us better nationally in responses to things like hurricanes and earthquakes? There wouldn't be a single person in the room that wouldn't say interoperable communications. Your radio has to be able to talk to my radio. Mm -hmm. If you have UHF and I have VHF, the only way for us to talk is for us to give you another radio and then you carry around two radios or three radios or four radios. If people are screaming and yelling at a cop from from uh, uh, Butler, Pennsylvania, that a guy is on the roof, and that cop has no ability to do what I described when we first started the conversation, no ability to, to pick it up and go, this is Butler 1, there's a guy with a gun on top of this building over here, and it doesn't go into the earpiece of the sniper, you've screwed it all up. You've screwed up your ability to do what everybody's up there to do. The second thing, Ray, that, that I have to ask is because we suffer in the in the in the AOR and and in, in the combat zone, we suffered with this even up till the day that we you know kind of toned things down in Iraq and and came out of Afghanistan. 
But this rules of engagement thing is always innocuous. And and the people um, that are in levels of areas of responsibility, they do not delegate the responsibility for people to make decisions tactically. And if at some point in time that sniper had that guy in his sights and could have taken him out long before he ever even had a chance to shoot, and they had to go some through some bureaucratic rigmarole to have somebody yeah. that wasn't even in Pennsylvania authorize him to shoot that guy. That's probably not. And is is that is that kind of the protocol? Like, is it is it there, we're, that ridiculous we're, we're, potentially? We're gonna find out. But they, yeah. they already hear some background rhetoric on. Well, these guys are these guys have full clearance to take out anybody with a weapon that they think. I disagree with that because in the Department of Defense, our soldiers were getting killed and jammed up and bad guys were getting away for years and years and years because we did not know how to decentralize the execution of the mitigation of bad guys because the, the, the bureaucrats had to have their fingers in it. Mm. Circa, circa Vietnam, right? Yeah, yeah field yeah. commanders that knew exactly what needed to be done. And by the time they allowed the rights to do it, we dropped a, bomb, a bunch of bombs on an MPL. That's crazy. And, th and then on the comms, just so I can make sure I understand this correctly. So, so if there's five different organizations involved in the security and, and 200 people, is everyone on the same communication channel or are there multiple communication? What you were saying earlier about the sniper not hearing medic one say, hey, there's a guy on the yeah. roof. Like, was that a was that a blunder or is that also stupid protocol that they're on different groups or on different channels? Actually, um, uh, FCC, Federal Communications Bureaucracy, that's uh, instituted in each and every department. So, so Police Department X decides that we're going to have this type of radio that goes through our dispatch. It might be UHF, it might be VHF, it might be a Motorola, it might be a different kind of brand. All of those kind of things. It might be a Generation 3, it might have, it might have um, the amount of crystals put in it where we can switch channels and talk to each other. So I have one radio that talks to a lot of people, but that's expensive. So then there's a budgeting thing that goes along with that. I've never been, you know, in in my 40 years of messing with this, over 40 years of messing with this, I have never been in an optimal situation other than with the Secret Service in Tokyo. I've never been in an optimal situation where everything taught. Even on military bases, the fire department will have one kind of radio. The medics will have a different kind. It's the stuff gets, gets, gets convoluted, Crazy. and then people start to do workarounds. So yeah. I, I'll, bet you, I'll bet you if we do this down, I'll bet you that the... Pennsylvania Highway Patrol and the Butler PD, the radios can't talk. There's no way that they can talk to each other. That's I'd be crazy, a, if I was man. A, if I was a That's great. And, 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 then secret, and then Secret Service as well. I can't imagine Secret Service is letting the Pennsylvania Highway Patrol and the Butler PD and the Sheriff's Department and Trump's security in on their their private Secret Service communication. So every institution is subject to leadership. And one or two leadership decisions can change the whole tactics, techniques, and procedures that people take forward into those types yeah. of situations. You know, if they dissect this the right way and they talk to the right secret service agents, you're going to find out that actually that was in the plan, that was recognized. And I'm really speculating. So, you know, people. Yeah, yeah. No, no. This I, is what I, I want. I may, I, may, I may end up on CNN or, or Fox News or whatever, but at the end of the day, throwing out you know, Dave Nordell's take on things. I do have some expertise in this, so I'm not just an idiot just talking yeah. off the top of my head. But I'll bet you, um, uh, in the end of the day, because you have to have a, for this to happen, it has to be the Swiss cheese model, right? Everything has to line up where you got a perfect hole through the, through the block of cheese. Yeah, I mean, you have to have you have to have failure at every single point in the in the in the in the space, and and so if Ray goes out and says, "Hey, that building's a high point; it needs to be cleared, and we need to put a guy on that," and you tell Dave, and Dave gets COVID tomorrow, so he wasn't at work, and you didn't send him an email, and he forgot to tell the next person, the next person takes it, and that that whole task is omitted from the sheet, and all of a sudden you get this 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 tyranny of things, and then. It's just like it's just like in the schoolyard when the teacher comes out and goes, "Who broke the window with the baseball?" and all the kids go, "He did it." Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Or it's like that. What? It's like that. That Spider Man meme where it's like three Spider Mans and they're all pointing, you know, at, at each other. No, I'm they're, with you, man. I think I think it's a mess. I think the timing was of it was interesting. You know, you've we've got the Republican National Convention oh. this week. Basically, we're recording this on a Monday, and it's 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 right. starting. To, it's starting tonight. All right, let me let me Wait, ask man. this final question on these guys. Who do sure. you think Trump's going to pick for his VP? Oh, I love it. I'm glad you asked me this question because I got to watch over the old story. I I'd love to actually kind of keep up on this. He said he's going to announce today. So you're going to have me recorded, Ray. So if I find out, there you go. Yeah, this have, is like no shit. You're going to have me recorded. All right. And, 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 the, uh, and the convention's just gabbling in now. So they're just getting, they're just getting started. So lots of, lots of excitement. So, so he's going to, he's going to pick. Uh, you know, Trump is, uh, uh, we all tend to gravitate back to our strengths when we make major decisions. You know, we don't go through the weak, the weak pieces of that. And I really think that Trump has a, uh, a need for, uh, flair. You know, he wants, he wants, you know, he wants lights and bells and whistles to go off when he announces it. So I have two, I have, I'll give you the main, my mainstream pick that I think, that I think he'll pick. And then I'll give you one to think about. And so that'll be my dark horse. All right. Um, I think he's gonna. I think he's gonna take Tim Scott because I think Tim Scott accentuates what he needs in a lot of ways to include temperament. So hold that thought. Okay. Marco Rubio would be a Marco Rubio would be a close second. Okay. Um, so I kind of like. I I I I like all of the ones that are out there. I'm not a big JD Vance fan, but I find it curious that only moments after he got shot in the ear, that Nikki Haley wasn't not only invited to the convention, but she's speaking out. And I almost oh. wonder if he is if he is not going to pick her. I almost wonder if he didn't call her and say, you know what, if we're going to go on this unity message, then let's let's talk about the things that we have in common and get away from the things. Oh my God! You know what? That is a wow. We do have this recorded ahead of time. If that ends up happening, man, you are you are Nostradamus because I I, I never even thought about her i thought I, I actually thought you were about to say robert f kennedy jr i thought you were about to say rfk oh, jr no. they're going to surprise everybody he's an independent and they're going to really leverage that to bridge the hell out of the 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 gap with the democrats because you know him and sure. trump have, have been cordial to each other man nikki sure. haley all right that's going to be a perfect lead into the next segment but I, sure. I will say, I hope he doesn't do that. I really, I really do. I think that lady is a nightmare. I think she epitomizes everything that is absolutely awful about that, that, everything. Have you, have, you, have you read her book though? Ray? No, I have not. I have not. She's, I, I, I would recommend. I would, I, I'm not going to try and change your mind, but I'd recommend that you read her book because she's going to okay. be on the national. She's going to be on the national stage for quite some time. And I'm going to give you an excerpt from my book. I and mean, this is not pull for Nikki Haley. I'm going to give you okay. an excerpt. Fair. She's the daughter. She's the daughter of Indian immigrants, not American Indians, Indians, Indian immigrants. Indians, yeah. And when her family came over here, they lived the, the traditional Indian values and the traditional Indian way. So the dress and all. So she talks a lot in the book about her experience with just what it feels like to be in that situation, to be a minority. And they're in South Carolina, which is, which is a thing. Her mother put her in the Miss, the Little Miss South Carolina um, contest when she was, you know, younger age, just five, six, seven at all. And at the end of the contest, they had three girls up at the front, her and two girls. One girl was white, one girl was black, and Nikki. And the judge came up and he said, he said, you know, you got to remember the time frame now. He goes, you know, every year we pick a Little Miss white South Carolina and a Little Miss Black South Carolina. And he says to Nikki, and you probably would have won, but we don't know what you are. It's a power, it's a powerful, it's a powerful story, man. And I, you know, all right, I, all right, I, I, I will, a, I will, a, I will and, read it. And, and that she talks a lot about how she had to make the decision to take the Confederate flag off the top of the Capitol because she's the governor that did that. Um, yeah, that wasn't that wasn't done that wasn't done lightly. And she talks a lot about how she handled Donald Trump and how they work together. And there's some really good okay. inside stuff there. I think you really enjoy it, Ray. It's a All good right. You know what? I will. I will. I will give it a read. I think it'll be interesting if he does go that route, man. It's it, just based on the history between the two of them. But then again, Trump and DeSantis had good history, then bad history, and you know, I think I, all and, these guys. And, and, 
and DeSantis is going to speak now too. Here's what. Yeah, I saw that. I don't. I don't know if you've almost died, Ray, but I have. When you almost die, you start to look at things a little differently. And and if he is truly, you know, he ripped up his twenty page speech. He's gonna he's gonna redo his speech, and it's gonna be focused on unity. Unity, yeah, I saw you, that. You you can you cannot ask a country as divided as we are right now to unify in any way, shape, or form. And he's a leader, and he understands this until you get unified in your own house. You can't you can't be throwing rocks at your brother and kicking him in the knee all the time and telling everybody in the neighborhood they need to get along. It didn't work. And that's all right, why all right, I I'm speculating that. on Nikki Haley. All right, that's a good speculation. All right, hey, I don't uh, do know. I don't know any more than you do. I don't know anything yeah. you get. <laughs> do you mind uh, sharing how you almost died? I mean, that oh, is yeah. a pretty good uh, statement. You know, I yeah, I mean, I was I was retired and I had taken my kid to the airport to go off to his dream job in Washington D.C. He's still up there in the middle of this quagmire, which he's a he's a great resource. And uh, I was sitting at the same desk in the same, you know, in the same computer that I'm sitting at now. And I stood up and I didn't know, but I had a blood clot that went from my groin to my ankle and my right leg. And that all broke loose and went into my lungs. And, uh, wow. and me, knowing, me knowing what I knew, I knew I was dying. And I told my wife, who's a nurse, and it was the same thing. I said, we need to try and make it to the hospital because uh, my, my day's not going so well. Yeah, it's, you know, millimeters away from, from not being here, so. So the blood clot broke off and then got into your, I guess, a vein or an artery oh, and started yeah, to head up through, to the heart. Yeah, no, it went it went into my lungs. So I ended your up lung. with uh, I went I ended up with close to a hundred blood clots all throughout my lungs, but I had one oh big clot that could have, could could have clotted out my pulmonary uh, artery, and if that would have happened, then it would end your night. So yeah. did you Never feel? Did you feel it? Uh, did you feel yeah, it? Was, like yes. Yeah, it's like getting hit by a truck. Then I started oh to turn goodness. blue. Blue is a bad color, you know. When you start to turn blue, you shouldn't be, you shouldn't yeah. be blue. Okay, blue is not good. All right, let me write that down. Blue is bad. <laughs> All right, let's get, let's, let's get into the, um, I mean, the Air Force, the Air Force yeah. stuff. You yes. know, yeah, yeah. I mean, listen, I, I, I think people will be fascinated at what is a career in the Air Force like? I mean, is it is it bureaucracy or is it, military or is it a combination of both and you know <sighs> what what is it like wow depends on where you sit so so my perspective comes from 30 years six six months and 24 days of service i started off with no no stripes in a barracks in san antonio texas in 1984 late late 1984 and i got out in in 2014 so for for people's perspective when I went in, Ronald Reagan was president. When I got out, Barack Obama was president. When I when I went in, there was a West Germany and an East Germany. And when I got out, there wasn't. Yeah. So, so, so you know, I went in as a cold warrior. I mean, it was all about nuclear weapons and, and beating the Russians in the folding gap in Germany and you know, fighting off the communist horde. That was a uh, that was a way. Uh, President Reagan's mantra was peace through strength, and and he piled a lot of money in the Department of Defense, but never wanted to find a war. Just wanted to, uh, you know, be tough enough and strong enough that nobody mess with it. I guess like being in prison, right? If you, you know, lift enough weights and you get big enough, people just don't mess with it. So yeah. not that I've been to prison, but I just use that as an analogy. But but uh, so when you're you know when you're young in the military, I wouldn't say the Air Force journey is exactly the same as the other services, but it's but it's close. When you're young and you're an enlisted guy. Uh, you know, you learn the culture, you kind of get stripped down, you, you lose the words I and me, and you learn how to work in teams and, you know, the we and us part of life. Uh, it's very, you know, it's, it's very directive because it has to be, um, if you don't do what you're told and do it the right way, you know, people can get hurt or die and you gotta, you gotta complete missions and, and it really puts a stamp on you. It's like, it's like being a hot dog, you know, you look like a hot dog, you get stuck in the microwave. Somebody turns the microwave on, you come out and you still look like a hot dog, but your DNA has all changed. And yeah, you you can never you can never really change change that DNA. But as you work through the as you work through the ranks, then you're exposed to more things. You're exposed to budget. You're exposed to all the money is allocated and spent and appropriated all the way through Congress and back. You're exposed to to a lot of deliberate leadership training, which is void in our country and other industries, which needs to come back tomorrow. Um, you know, 
you're you're always in school. You know, the Air Force has its own community college. It's so easy to get at least an associate's degree before you get out, you know, on your first enlistment. And so there's there's lots of opportunities there. But there's a big ask, you know, and, and you know, I I speak on, on moral injury. I mean, you, you go in the United States military with all these foundational things, whatever your religion is, your mom said, your dad said, things you do, things you don't, all all that type of stuff. You know, what's right, what's wrong. And quite frankly, military service flies in the face of that almost every day because through doctrine and military orders, you've got to do things that fly in the face of your morality. You know, the most extreme would be all of us know that there's huge consequences for killing somebody else. And almost all of us believe that killing another human being is like the most uber bad thing you can do on the scale. But yet for us to do our mission, it requires us to take other human lives. That's pretty heavy stuff, if you think about it. No, it's heavy, man. That's heavy. That's definitely heavy. And 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 quite frankly, it's the it's it's what you do, no matter what your specialty is. I was a medic, so I'm supposed to be saving lives, but at the same time I'm supposed to be keeping the people healthy to go take lives. So it's you know, everything's interlocked. You know, just because you you do finance doesn't mean that you're not important because don't pay a soldier and watch what their morale is and it's so it's all it's all in it's all in it. And yeah, and you have to yeah. be, you have to be careful of that. And then as you get up into the ranks where I was at, where I'm, you know, I'm working with general officers, those are my bosses. I'm, I'm their, I'm their senior advisor on all things, you know, all things enlisted and my own welfare and operational, operational, you know, issues and equipment and all those type of things. Then you really get to see the other bill in their military industrial complex and what that looks like or what that's attached to. Then you're in rooms and you're making decisions and you go, you know, who's all these guys with ties? Well, they're, that's the guy from Raytheon, and that's the guy from Lockheed, and that's the guy from, you know, Boeing, and you know, and they're like, well, why are they here? Well, because you know the weapon systems with, that they use; those people are all the people that that have built them because it's been contracted that way. And how do you let contracts and how how is money appropriated and, and used and spent and you know and and spent and and so yes, you do get to see the. Forty-seven dollar toilet seat, and uh, you know the you know the misappropriation of you know the misallocation of, of stuff where it's fraud, waste, and abuse, and things have to be governed and checked on. And then you see other people that are magicians at it, and they are great stewards of of uh, of the taxpayers' money. And and you see some really really good things come out of that. So it's just a it's it's just a wash back and forth. But top right. Um, yeah, right. And, you know, Eisenhower, you know, on his last day in office, I mean, that was his big warning, right? Don't yeah. let the country, don't let the, don't let the military industrial complex drive the decisions you make in the country. In some ways, Ray, he may have been even late in the game when he said it. Because if you take, let's just take a soldier. Let's take a soldier in the field, right? And they're, they're in combat. You know, so the, what they got to have? They got to have a helmet. They got to have glasses. They got to have ear protection. They got to have a uh, flak vest. They got to have a uniform. They got to have boots. Um, they have to have a certain level of training. They have to have ammunition. They have to have a weapon. Now, if I had a if I had a Marine sniper here sitting next to me, he'd name off twenty seven other things he needs to have. All right? He has to have that. Well, who makes all of that? How does it get there? And how do you sustain it? So think about the tentacles that come off of just one soldier. Think about the tentacles that run back into our economics off of one soldier. So why is the battle over the defense budget so vile? Because there has to be trade-offs to do this for this one soldier. And by the way, it doesn't get any less expensive because the people that are making those things are for-profit organizations that have bottom lines that need to grow, and most of them have stockholders. So you have to handle all of that. So if you think that, if you think that, the stock price or the price of oil or the stock price on Lockheed Martin today has nothing to do with national defense. You're not. You're not. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. And, and, that stuff is all that stuff is absolutely all related. And you talked about Eisenhower and I've played that clip where he 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 basically said, you know, the greatest threat is the military industrial complex. And I think he really gets credit for introducing that terminology. But but the crazy thing is that was in. I think in 61 or 62 or something, you know, the term is, the term has been there, but I don't think it's really, 
come to the forefront much or or the way it has at least the past maybe maybe couple years now i want to i want to go to kennedy because i want your thoughts mm-hmm. on that you know i did a whole episode on the jfk assassination and yeah. you know i've looked into that from my perspective you know the way i see it is I mean, first of all, I don't see it as Oswald, and I don't see it as a single bullet. It just makes no sense to me. Okay. But I do see the the plausibility of him saying, hey, I want to come out of Vietnam. And Vietnam, to me, almost was the first forever war or the first war that really employs the military-industrial complex. So – could it be plausible that those people behind that did not want to come out of Vietnam? And so what happened at Kennedy was a result of that. I mean, what are your thoughts on? Well, in a generic form, Ray, let me tell you something. As I get older, and especially as I look back on my military career, or I start to even work through, through things now as a, you know, I'm mostly retired guy, even though I'm working on veteran, veteran issues. Here's what I know. If you have a really complex problem, you really, really want the answer to something? Don't spend your time trying to find out the why. Just follow the money. Yeah, yeah. Because it, because it always drags you back to the answer. It always drags you back to the answer. And so let me let me pop different here for a minute because I'll drive it back to that. And maybe you you can start to fill in the blanks. So I just turned 59 years old for context. So everybody can go, well, how long has this guy been alive? So I was born in 65. My first memory was when my grand, my, my uncle ran me over with a tractor when I was four. Uh, you know, I remember, I obviously, I, I obviously remember, I obviously remember the Apollo program. I remember, I remember Nixon resigning and I remember, you know, I was however many years old when we came out of Vietnam. I remember those things. Here's, here's what I know is. I had never, I mean, I've seen a lot of stuff, you know, not, I was in an airplane in 9-11, you know, and I, I lived through COVID with everybody else here. We just keep on going on and on, right? So here's what I know is, and I was in the military at, at the senior enough level that I saw some, so, you know, I, I've got to be the, the number two guy in the background going through a 60 minutes interview, and that's never comfortable either, especially when it's a negative thing. I mean, talk about all this stuff. Here's what I know is, I have seen people go after people. Because they want gone. I've seen it in I've seen it since I've been out in corporate America. I've just seen, you know, executive decisions. It's like that guy needs to go. And and there's there's way he turns certain levels levers and do certain things and either make him so miserable they go away or those kind of things. And I've seen the arms of government be utilized to help other arms of government. It happens in combat all the time. You know, one of the one of the biggest uh, entities that we had in Afghanistan for years was the Department of Agriculture because we were trying to teach those people how to grow stuff other than poppies and to freaking feed mm. themselves and get out of the drug trade, right? But nobody understands how that, that affects national security. They think the Department of Agriculture is worried about locusts in Nebraska, and that's not the case. They have a, They have an actual political arm. This stuff is all tied together. So when you put all of that stuff together, it's pretty powerful, right? You can get at, you know, you can get at Ray and Dave in a lot of ways. You can get at us through the IRS. You can get at us through through uh, just intelligence. I mean, you can follow us around with a camera and take pictures of us and put them on the web and change people's impressions of us. You can blow up political campaigns down there. I had never, ever, and, and so to your point, because you're asking why did you get, get killed, not whether or not he was killed by more than one person or who did it. You're saying what was the underlying larger you know, strategic international motives, you know, who would want to kill him. I've never seen anybody gone after in such a way that I have seen go after Trump. Mm. And that's not a really endorsement of Trump. I've just never seen everything brought to bear. I mean, if you think yeah. about it, and he was a former president. I mean, midnight raids authorized on his lawyer's office and blowing up lawyer clan uh, privilege. Going down to Mar-a-Lago and going into his house, you know, just just you knowing well, they just blow on things up and take him whatever you want. And what's amazing to me is, if it was there, it would be there. Right, right, it's, right. I mean, I mean, you know, if you if you dig a hole and you get going, and then you all of a sudden you, you pop out the other end and you're in China, you go, well, I'm here. Well, there's no reason to keep running up and down the hole because you've dug it already. I'm yeah, not telling yeah. you, brother. So so if you go back to that. If you go back to that, if there's enough pressure in the right places, economically, where you're going to affect people for money, 
Yeah. I don't I don't think that anything is off the table or any. No, I'm with you. I'm with you. And I agree with what you said about Trump. I mean, the way they have vitrally gone after him. I mean, again, you know, the, the problem is Trump derangement syndrome is a real thing. And for those people that 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 absolutely despise him and, and my audience knows, like I've talked to a million. I call a spade a spade. I call a spade a spade on Trump. I call a spade a spade on Biden. I call a spade a spade on Obama, Bernie Sanders, everybody, Nikki Haley, all those guys. Sure. So like the, the, the problem with Trump is he is just for some reason, this guy has, I mean, honestly, unlike anybody in our lifetime has just caused such strong feelings one way or the other. It's really interesting. Like it doesn't, it, I haven't figured out like, what is it about him that causes, I mean, the ones that love him, love him and the ones that hate him. I mean, they hate him. I make this joke all the time and I'll make it again. It's like he slept with their wife or something. I mean, like, what the hell? Why, why is yeah. that that hate so absolutely vitriol? Let, let me, let me, let's move into, I really like the stuff you've talked about in terms of, you know, following the money and all of that. Oh, and to me, man. one of the best examples of that really becomes Afghanistan. I mean, that's a 20 year forever war that we got into under the the guise of weapons of mass destruction we Not have to them. get them you know saddam has them which people didn't realize that's okay them. that's iraq that's a whole different country that's not mm -hmm. osama bin laden afghanistan but we kind of went after both 20 years of that and then we come out in 2021 and turn Afghanistan right back to the Taliban. Like to me, if there ever was a case of calling BS through following the money, that's it. Because in those 20 years, that's a lot of money that exchanged hands with a lot of people in this military industrial complex. Give us your thoughts on that overall. Well, so... At the risk of sounding like I'm talking down to people, because I'm sure your audience is well read and well educated. You know, Afghanistan starts after 9 11, right? And once you're in, you kind of get sucked in. And I, mm. I, I, I caution everybody to not look at war and conflict in a nation based on are the bad guys there or is that, are they bad people? You know, when we, when, when, when we went into Iraq the first time, that was about bad guys. That was about, you guys need to get out of Kuwait, and we're going to shore that out. And then you guys go back to being Iraq, and we're not going to go to Baghdad, we're not going to, and we're not going to displace you. The reason, and the reason being is, is because for us, our nas internationally, nationally, you know, our national security was shored up because we now have a forever ally in Kuwait, and they hold the keys to the, you know, to the, to the poor. That feeds all the oil through the Gulf of Mexico. That's a big deal. In Afghanistan, you know, why did the Russians go into Afghanistan? Because they yeah, didn't like the that Afghanis? Is, that is. Oil they is a big deal. Why I mean, they oil in, in general is a big deal. It, is, it was about natural resources. Was, the, the, the stuff that is in those hills in Afghanistan, it's all that you can't find any place else in the world or not in, in that level of abundance. It's about natural resources. But to go in there, you've got to be able to deal with the government that can actually trade and let you mine and do those things. I mean, we do some of this stuff in, in the, you know, Western and South, uh, Southwestern Africa. I mean, we have companies in there that are mining natural resources that come back here that, you know, are probably in my computer and then the you know, microphone you use. Absolutely. Just, you know, and we just take that stuff for granted. You know, as much of a, of a country of milk and honey that the United States is, because we do have we have every climate in our in our nation, we have all piles of natural resources that we can get at. There's still stuff we don't have, and so for us to build the next uh, whatever it is, go to Mars, build a bomb, uh, medical technology to save a life, for us for us to do those kind of things, we have to have access. For us to have access, you get access in two ways: either through relationship or you own the property, you know, at some level, you own the property, you know, those type, those type of things. So you have to be really careful when you're going to use the military to go into some place, what the overall mission is, and it has to be clearly articulated. And what ties our general's hands is, is that you tell the general, I want you to go take down a hill. 
but don't hurt the hill too much because we're going to need the hill later and we don't want to upset everybody because they like the hill. And in the long term, we want to have a government that is favorable to our government with a leader that's favorable to us so that we can have these type of agreements because really in the end, we want the raw minerals in the hill. This has really hell, nothing. Yeah. We have this really has nothing to do with a military objective. This has to do with leveraging the military to put ourselves in a strategic way. So, I say that not in a negative way. If we enjoy our way of life, if we enjoy our freedoms, we truly are patriots, and we understand the Constitution, and we and we cherish democracy, and we cherish our freedoms and our ability to move around. We have to have stuff. And for us to have stuff, we have to have relationships. And for us to have relationships, it means we have to go places. And so sometimes when we go places, the motive changes because you have people in Washington, D.C. that aren't satisfied with achieving a military objective. Go get Bin Laden. Go take out the Taliban. You know, stabilize whatever. That, that's, that's not the mission. The mission starts to grow beyond that. It starts off with like this. Well, now that we're here, how do we want to position ourselves strategically? The, the, the right. magical exit plan that you hear about all the time. Is there an exit plan? Well, yeah, the exit plan is is we want total unfettered access at the end of this to all of these things because it helps us have what we want to have. It's to, it it is it is um it is um it's it's cannibalism is what it is you almost you almost gotta you almost, you know you're you're eating on yourself to survive and then you wonder how long that that's gonna last um so you just gotta i mean people this stuff is more digestible i don't want I, there's a couple things i want to i want i want people to understand because i'm sure i've been labeled already because that's what we do as humans i mean not that yeah. the audience is bad but people have already put me in the boxes right because that's what happens first of all i am not a hardcore right conservative I'm I am right down the middle um, independent, and I have some left leaning uh, social things that go along with the fact that I put way too many people in body bags. I've delivered way too many babies, and I've seen man's in humanity to man. Then I know that we can do that. So the way it is right now, static, is not the right way. There has to be some sort of progress, some sort of movement forward that just needs to be done, and in, in the right aspect. The second thing is is. I'm not talking negatively about the military or our, our country's position or how big or how small it should be or what we should be doing as military people, but it's all of our responsibilities. This is the waking up that we need, Ray. It's all of our responsibilities to understand. You know, people are like, I don't know why I had to have geography in school. Well, you need to know where the hell a place is and on the planet. If we're going to go there and be part of that, if it's going to affect all of us nationally, our sons and daughters and everybody, you need to be able to understand it. You need to be able to pick on So, so learn geography. Um, I don't, I don't need to know macroeconomics. Well, if you don't know geography and you don't know macroeconomics, you're probably not qualified to get into that conversation around. Because right. you need to know That's how, right. you need to know how things move and, and the push pulls to all of this stuff. And then you need to understand. What causes fear and pain in humans? Basic fear and pain in humans. This is psychology, right? Why do I have to take psychology? Because if you understand the basic things that make the human body go, especially our psyche, then you'll understand how people get manipulated and how you manipulate other people. And then you can see it while it's happening and then we're not a bunch of sheep. Then you can yeah. actually look at it and go, hey, listen, are you just trying to scare the hell out of me or is this a real thing? For instance... Do I really need a shot or do you just want me to have a shot so you scared me to death and you think, I think I'm going to be in my grave in two days if I don't get a shot? Well, yeah, that's a great – I don't know. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's, a, and that's so, a great one. And I think a lot of people are coming to that realization, you know, we're, we're, we're almost four years removed from well, – three years removed from all of that stuff. And a lot of – I think a lot of people right now are are asking themselves, man, did I really need – if not the first two – did I really need that third booster? Did I need that fourth booster? Did I need that fifth booster? What's going on? And and, and again, I mean, this is just real talk. And by the way, I, I will say what I what I really appreciated in our conversation when when we had our initial conversation to kind of talk about and get to know each other a little bit. Man, I wish I had hit record on that thing because there were some there were some gold, some nuggies in there that were what fantastic. We we had some good stuff, but you know that what? Your your common sense to me. And and that's what I'm trying to 
advocate for. And that's what I'm trying to get people to understand. You know, the things and the way you talk about things, even, 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 even honestly, we disagree on Nikki Haley, but the way you, the way you position that to me was very common sense and it, it will enable me and allow me to revisit her from a different lens, maybe a lens that I'm a little more open to sort of seeing what she's all about. So, so I really appreciate the, the way you position that stuff. Cause I don't consider you far right. I don't consider you far left. I, I consider you kind of centrist down the middle, or you know what? Let's not even put a term on it. Let's just right. call it right. common but sense. Man. But, but, but people, as they digest our conversation, need to be able to move us around in the boxes. And if you're going to put me in the box, I just want me to be in the right box. So I, I don't have yeah. no trouble explaining that. You know, Ray, here's the deal. It's like raising kids. The kid comes to you and he says, Dad, why is, why are the leaves green? Now you can tell him, well, it's chlorophyll and explain for the synthesis, or you can hand him a book and say, look this up. And then come back and you tell me what photosynthesis is. It's two different things, right? One, they had to do the work, which means they'll pay more attention, they'll absorb more, they'll have better understanding, yeah. and they can be good. Te- they can be good teachers. The other one is, you just gave it to them, and you know what they do? The next time that they have something that, that challenges them, them mentally or or their perception, they go, "Why is yeah the grass brown brown over there?" Right? And then you tell them that. Well. You start living your life like that. So anything that's difficult or you don't understand, you go ask somebody. Well, whatever that answer is becomes your reality, and that's not doing the work. So if you want, if you want true internal answers that can drive true opinion, true passion, and motivate you to, to be an activist in whatever you want to be in, an activist in, do the work. Do the yeah, work. Do get the, the, work, get the data. You got to do the work. Absolutely. Totally, totally, totally agree with that. hundred percent. Give us some. So, so, so what do you, I know you're kind of retired now, but are you uh, working with, are you working with veterans? And then I also want to kind of talk a little PTSD because I feel like you have yeah, you expertise, know. like, like, like you know. help us understand that really. That's like, I mean, obviously yeah. everyone's heard those, that acronym, but you know, God, what is that really like? It's gotta be pretty bad, yeah. huh? I'll, I, I'll make it really simple for you. So to answer the veteran work, um, you know, I took on a project that's been that's been pretty difficult, Rain, but, you know, if you don't do the hard work, you're probably not, probably not going to be fully satisfied. There's really not a lot of really formal stuff out there when veterans transition. And if you remember me talking to you about the hot dog, when you come out and your DNA is changed, it's hard to reassimilate. It just is. And we all yeah. you know, reassimilate a different... Some people come back in the civilian world and they are absolutely fine. And other guys and gals struggle right up to the point in time where they end up committing suicide and and everything in between. But my work is focused on the fact that, you know, data-driven and done the homework, two and a half years of homework, 50% of veterans leave their jobs in their first year and up to 80% are gone in two years. And the reason is, is the environments that they go to don't know how to take care of veterans. Now mm-hmm. you say, well, what the hell does that mean? Well, I can tell you if I was in a wheelchair and I went and applied for a job and you hired me, they'd know exactly what to do for Because there's a thing called the American Disabilities Act and you read it and you have to comply with that. Plus, right? You know, the thing that we probably cherish most in the world is if you have children, they're probably right at the top of the list of the things that are most important. If you're going to take your kid to daycare, you don't take them to, you just don't take them to daycare and drop them off, right? You go to the daycare, you walk around, you look at every square inch, you talk to everybody in the staff, you make sure there's not sharp things laying all over the floor. You talk to 10 parents that already have their kids at the daycare. And then you, when you do take your kid to the daycare, you vet them to make sure that they're thriving for three to six months before you even get into any routine. With veterans, we drive it to the curb, we point at the building and we say, go in there, I hope it works out for you. Because the people in the building don't understand the veteran transition. So I've built a program that's there for any employer that has the motivation to do what, what to do the real steps that need to be done beyond thank you for your service. I appreciate thank you for your service. It's become kind of cliche, and it's uh, you know it's uh, for me my answer is God bless you when people say that. 
But really what we need is, is we need um, corporate America and large scale, small business, all the way to the biggest of the big. Some of them have programs, mm -hmm. but they need to be vet ready. They need to understand they need to have an expert like myself in their companies to help guide them through this veteran transition and help guide the veterans through it, create the environment so the veterans can transition. Because once that happens, our country gets stronger. We come with leadership and problem solving and critical thinking and, and teamwork and 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 you know a variety of other things just the flat the flat skills and the did or done stuff and the dedication and we want to ride for the brand and we want you know we're working for the guy on the right of us and the guy on the left of us when you go to combat you're not fighting for a flag of her country you're fighting for your bike and so we need to realize that then then companies need to do that and i will tell you it has been a really tough sell right it's been a tough sell yeah. it's been a this it's an uphill battle do you think do you think that's because companies in corporate America. I mean, I, I feel like veterans deserve so much more across the board on everything. I mean, talk about making a sacrifice. I mean, that's, that's mm. in not only the ultimate sacrifice when you make the ultimate sacrifice as in getting killed, I think it's the ultimate sacrifice, even dedicating yourself to that. You know what I mean? Like, like, like I don't, I don't have the fortitude to do that and so i respect the hell out of people that have the fortitude to go and do that and it does seem like a complete shame that when they end their military service or come back into you know the civilian population you would think there would just be a much more organized transition plan for them versus what you said of like, Hey, here, there's your new office. Good luck. You know, catch up with me in six months. Is it, I, I mean, I have to imagine companies just don't understand it. Do they not value it? Do they think veterans are not smart? Like it just doesn't make sense. But I think, well, I think right off of the top is, is what I'm proposing is a relook at their culture, policies, mm -hmm. procedures, and the culture. And I think that a lot of people shy away when you talk culture because culture smells like work. And we're just not geared anymore to think about, to think strategically, to think long range, to think about doing the work. We're geared about, you know, what's in it for me? How do I look? How do I look? You know, what, how do I look in the mirror when it's all over with? And, uh, and experience, you know, how can, how can I do that? Um, that, as quick and economical and all those things. And, and, and some of this is slow moving. And, and quite frankly, we've got, you know, we have 46,000 veteran service organizations trying to plug the holes that are left between the Department of Defense and the, and the um, Veterans Administration in this transition environment. That's everything from taking guys fishing and gals fishing and getting people together and doing those kind of things. You know, maybe we need to legislate it. I've written what I think is core legislation and put it in the hands of some people to the champion and maybe we need a we need an amendment to the american disabilities act and a chapter about military transition and what employers need to do um because sometimes people that's the only thing people understand is if it's a law and somebody's gonna take money out of your pocket because you haven't done the program appropriately so you just have to follow the money right yeah you just have to yeah. follow the money and so and so there's a there's a little stopping point there but i will tell you now think about people that come out with PTSD and moral injury, and I'm not. I'll separate the two for you. Uh, let me let me let me boil PTSD down down into one basic statement. Because PTSD, you know, post traumatic syndrome, you know, uh, mm -hmm. post traumatic distress, PT, uh, um, um, uh, is is uh, not everybody has it. Um, some people that have never saw, seen combat have it. Uh, for a variety of reasons, um, the high, the high, high, high PTSD community is, is people that have been assaulted slash sexually assaulted. Um, one in four of every one in, and one in every four females that serve in the Department of Defense has been sexually assaulted. And so that's a real thing. And that's prevalent, uh, especially on the, on the veteran side when they come out to have these things. PTSD wow. is this, right? No, I, I don't know, but you got to do the homework. People can get emotional about this and go, "Yeah, and, you know, he's got PTSD. They have PTSD. You got to, you got to know that. You got to know what it's, what you're up against." So, so um, PTSD is this: there are things in life that you experience, Ray, that you can't unhear, unsee, and unsmell. You can apply that. You can apply that to law enforcement. And by the way, when you're talking about service, 
please do not forget about firemen and EMS and and cops. Because yeah, it's is, is, is ident- it's ident- it is absolutely identical. And I, when I say cops, I'm talking about everything from from game wardens to forest rangers to all of those people. Um, that is a life of service. Every day that you get up and you put on a uniform and that and that type of service environment, it's never about you. It's always about somebody else, and we're usually always dealing with something when somebody's at their ultimate worst, and we're trying to make it better. And that's that's religious, man. I mean, that's stuff Jesus that did. And so, yeah. you know, and, and so, you know, they're, they're, we, we read a lot of books, Ray, but we don't read the Bible. And the answers to a lot of our problems in the world are in the Bible. You don't, yeah. listen, you don't got to be a Bible thump and evangelical in church studying it all the time. But if you do a little Bible study, if you have a true problem within this day and age with electronics, you don't even got to have a Bible. Yeah. Just get on your chat it's... GPT or Google and say, and say, what would Jesus say about my extramarital relationship it's going to give oh, you nine thousand. it's going to give you nine thousand things to read with interpretations to it and it's no different than sitting on the on the knee of an old wise man getting some yeah really that's good. interesting i i have asked chat gpt so, a lot of things but i have not asked chat gpt that but that's a good one i'm going to do it all right, listen, Dave, th- this is awesome, man. I-, I really appreciate the perspective, not only from, you know, uh, the start of the conversation and, and helping us understand. I-, I thought it was very valuable to understand the Secret Service and the other organization and, and comms mm-hmm. and all that going into the military industrial complex stuff. And really, you know, uh, you-, you said a lot of things that that I'm going to come back to but like the the concept of natural resources in these countries and then understanding you know when when does it cross the line from oh we're going after the bad people to really going after the bad people becomes the guise of us going in to gain the natural resources that are needed and then i mean man those are such big That's conversations like, well, and they're I, heavy conversations I, yeah. But, you know, if you look at geography, right? If you start in India, right? Yeah. India is the most, most populous country in the world. They have nuclear weapons. If you go, if you go west to Pakistan, which Pakistan's only been a country since, what, 1947? Because it used to yeah. all be India. And then after the Ottoman yeah. Empire fell, they split in half. They have nuclear weapons. Then you have Afghanistan. Well, the next, the next country west is Iran. And they have nuclear weapons. This stuff all matters. And if you put a whole army in between the middle of all of that, and you include the fact that it borders China, you think people get uncomfortable? You think that no, there's, no. That there's something beyond? Just, yeah, it's, but, you, but if you can't look at a map and you can't explain that, you can't draw it and you can't see it in your head. That's that's an excellent point, dude. That's an excellent point. You talked about India, Pakistan, Iran. If you if you look at a map, those countries all in that Middle Eastern area are all geographically close. But you don't you don't see us going into Pakistan, India or Iran because they do have nuclear weapons. I think nuclear weapons are even to the to the big bad United States. They're a deterrent. But Afghanistan doesn't have nuclear weapons. You know, Iraq at the time, I don't think had nuclear weapons. Um, no. Oh, my gosh. I mean, look at what's going on in Gaza. Don't, they don't have nuclear weapons, obviously. So, that's, a, that's an interesting thing with the geography, the so, way you said that. I like that. And, and, the, and the whole North Korean strategy has been for us to survive as an isolated state with, with the purest of communism. The only way for us to operate internationally is to get a nuclear weapon, because then people have to talk to us different, and they can't, and they can't yeah. just come rushing across our borders. That's an interesting point, and 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 yeah. great point about geography, man. Even even man, I'm it's gonna huge. probably I, I I'm gonna study a map more because you do want to understand all these all the all these locations and like what you talked about earlier with what's going on in the DRC and the Congo region in terms of the cobalt mining and the lithium and the unbelievably awful conditions there but lithium goes into everything that we use technology wise from your tesla to our computers to our apple iPhones and all that and 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 you just don't, you know, you don't get the truth of what that is all about. That's another thing that 
man, it's there's a lot, man. Right. There's a lot. And so, and, so lot the, and, and so the new currency, the other the other money to follow is information. Now that you have Google and Twitter and, and the way the information moves. So if you follow the owners, if if you can control the information, then you can control absolutely you really look at those absolutely. things. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, Dave, any any parting words of wisdom or or any any more predictions? Man, I've got you on the record with a with with just, a good one that just, could end up putting well, on the map if it turns out to be we'll true. See, Anything we'll else? See, hey, get, Here's here's the scary thing. In in 2018, I got asked by our uh, CEO of our hospital region as a disaster manager what my biggest concern was, and I said, I said uh, I have two. I said we got to learn how to better expand these hospitals because we're going to need more beds when we have a pandemic. And I said that in 2018. Wow. And wow. we started preparing for a pandemic in 2018. So when I say stuff, people always look at me and they're like, oh, I don't want to hear what you have to say. Here's my here's my prediction. You're not going to like this, but your show is kind of geared around it. My prediction is that the next the next big catastrophe in this nation that will, that will ultimately drive us back together and probably get us uh, out of this divide and make people do a little more homework is the fall of healthcare. And if you really watch, it's really crumbling and a lot of places are on their knees already. And when we can't start, you know, every, everybody is a human, no matter how much money you have. And everybody's aging. Father time's undefeated. And so at the top of everybody's list is healthcare because they want to feel as good as they can for as long as they can. And if healthcare starts to fail in this country, it will make things look like the 2008 uh, uh, stock market crash mm-hmm. and Detroit. And those th- it'll make it look all like just chunk change. It's a big deal. And I, th- I think it's probably closer than we know. Okay. All right. Very interesting. Dave Nordell. All right. Listen, I'm going to thank you for your service because I have to. I know it's cliche, but anyway, hey, man, I, I, re- I really enjoyed this. And like I like I had mentioned to you before, I'd love to be able to kind of call on you. So, I think there's going to be a lot know. more crazy situations that come and you have such a mm-hmm. vast perspective from the military, from the military to then how it relates to society that I'd love to be able to bring you back on to talk about different things. Good Hopefully night. there'll be no more assassination attempts, but anything else All that right. kind of happens, I'm, I'm going to call on you, my man. All, All right. right, brother. I appreciate All you, right, man. man. Thanks, Thanks again for the time. It's Take good. care. Bye. Good night. Good night. This episode was brought to you by the new book, Deep Shallow Dive Into You, available now on Amazon and Barnes and Noble in hardcover and paperback. Don't forget to sign up for our new mailing list on our website at deepshallowdive.com.